study skins have been critical to uh, this whole process from the very beginning when Linnaeus was using binomial and, uh, protocol to name and describe and categorize uh, specimens. This first slide. So Alexander Wilson used this specimen to describe Mississippi kite. So this is a holotype. The specimen is at the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. Despite it being described over 200 years ago, the specimen is in still good shape. And we know from specimens of this age, some of the 250, 300 years old, coupled with archaeological data, where you have mummified things like falcons that are basically, in essence, a study skin, some of these archaeological digs, these things date back to over 2,000 years. So we, from those lines of evidence, we're pretty confident that if we maintain these specimens in an archival quality condition, they should last at a minimum of a few thousand years. Now these earlier specimens had almost no data with them. We were lucky to have a locality and perhaps a date. Well, our recent specimens, I'm going to use this vervain uh, hummingbird that's found on the islands of Jamaica and Hispaniola as an example of a data-rich specimen. These are kinds of data that are typically associated with a specimen today. And you can see it has on the front of this, you have locality and GPS generated uh, coordinates and of course the data collection. Now this is the back side of this uh, hummingbird's uh, tag and you have this whole suite of data and I want to point out one in particular this mass. If you look at this specimen, 2.2 grams, this is one of the smallest birds in the world vying its close relative to think it's in the same genus, the, Cuban hubbin, uh, the bee hummingbird in Cuba. So this is one of the smallest in the world. And for the last 30 years, we've been routinely taking tissue samples from birds. And you see this tissue number here in the left-hand part of this tag. You have a tissue number associated that we typically take liver, heart, and muscle. And depending on the conditions we're working on, if we're in a field condition, we often have liquid nitrogen or uh, if that's not available, we'll preserve tissues in uh, ethanol. But ultimately, all these things get transferred to uh, ultra-cold freezers or a cryo facility. Now, in addition to those core data that we have with every specimen these days, we often have ancillary information. I don't have time to go through all of these, but I'm going to concentrate on these first two to give you a little uh, example of each. This wonderful bird is a Indo-Chinese green magpie. This is from uh, southern Vietnam. And it's not only spectacular in plumage, but it has these really neat vocalizations. But what I want to point out in this slide of this bird is this bright red bill. Look, at it has an eye ring. It's red, a reddish-brown irides. And even though this is slightly overexposed and it's kind of washed out, it has bright yellow underparts. This is what the specimen, the same individual, looks like a few months after it's been preserved. Notice the bill's uh, faded. You can, you can barely see this faded eye ring. Obviously, cotton has replaced the irides. And in this next uh, image, you see how this thing is faded quite a bit. There's a number of birds that have these red and yellow pigments that are unstable. They're often associated with diet. And so this is why we need to add this additional documentation of these specimens of recording soft part colors as well as plumage characters. Now, this looks like I did a bad job of a skin, but it was actually intentionally. This is a Bicknell thrush. And note that the bill is missing, and a lot of the other skeletal elements are not associated with this specimen. This is called a SMU. Uh, and those kinds of studies where if we, in some cases, we have uh, a, spec uh, a species that's poorly represented in collections, there might only be a few individuals in the world's collections. And we don't want to have to make a choice be between doing a classic study skin uh, versus maybe doing a skeleton. So we do a, a combination of those and preserve the plumage like this. And associated with this is a full skeleton. And you also will have that in studies if you're looking at geographic variation, say if you're studying a song sparrow or a fox sparrow and you need to have those plumage characters, but you may be using the skeletal elements as a proxy for uh, body size. So you want to have all of those skeletal elements. So this is sort of a hybrid combination from that classic study skin. 
Now, study, scan, study scans have been uh, integral to the field guide process from the very beginning. And this is an example of Roger Torrey Peterson's 1934 field guide, where he got uh, a large number of people on this continent involved in birds very early on. And of course, co commit with that was conservation at the back side of that. Even today, in, most, in uh, publications such as Birds of Peru, this is Dan Lane, one of the authors and one of the primary artists of uh, Birds of Peru. He's using these study skins right here to depict one of the more difficult groups of birds in, the, uh, in at least the Western Hemisphere, these uh, small tyrannid flycatchers. So again, with field guides, study skins continue to be a keystone part of uh, depicting a field guide, even though we have digital photography these days. Now I want to shift to underscoring how study skins can be used in uh, scientific investigations. And believe it or not, we have this amazing collection, and these are house sparrows. And we have three huge cabinets filled with S, plus about four smaller cabinets filled with skeletons, nearly 14,000 specimens of house sparrow. You go, well, what the hell are you doing with that many <laughs> house sparrows? Well, there's an ornithologist at KU named Dick Johnston in the uh, 1960s that had a brilliant idea of looking at how a species taken from its main distribution, its primary distribution, in this case in Europe, how it was in introduced throughout the world as Europeans went to different parts of the world, whether it was Buenos Aires or Santiago, Chile, or Mexico City or Argentina or uh, 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 Australia, they knew exactly when these birds had been introduced in these various areas. And so they went out, he and his students, and collected 14,000 of uh, those birds. And interestingly, that th what they did to document those changes was using morphology and uh, plumage uh, coloration. And what happened just a few years ago to show you how, when they went out and collected this, they couldn't collect genetic data. And with the advent of uh, sequencing DNA, a graduate student from the University of California came in here about five years ago and went and sampled from the toe pads of those house sparrows and was able to sequence DNA. So now we have another layer of information associated with those uh, study skins and that morphometric data that wasn't there originally. So it's one of those examples of how you cannot predict how specimens might be used in the future. So that was dealing with populational differences, how you would use study skins to document a population difference. Well, recently uh, there's been a study published that uh, went in and used these Carolina parakeets, a bird that's been extinct for, since at least the 1930s, and the specimens that they used in this study were over 100 years old. Like the house sparrows, they went in and sampled the toe pads and were able to sequence uh, two mitochondrial genes and come up with a phylogeny of parakeets, including Carolina parakeet. Prior to this study being published this year, the basic premise for the closest relative of Carolina parakeet was green parakeet that's found in adjacent Mexico, but geographically quite uh, close to Carolina parakeet. Same body form, same size, and even in some individuals you have yellow and orange, not unlike a Carolina parakeet. So that was the basic premise of who the closest relative of Carolina parakeet was until the spring when in the April issue of the AUK, this graced the cover and was the lead article. Group of researchers, here's Carolina parakeet. Much to surprise, it was not sister to Eratinga holocroia, the green parakeet that's in a different clade. Carolina parakeet is actually more closely related to a group of parakeets in southern South America. So this was very surprising. And one of those close relatives was this black hooded parakeet of southern South America. If you look at this, you can see why ornithologists using plumage didn't think this was a close relative of Carolina parakeet. This is uh, another relative of Carolina parakeet. Now, this looks more like a Carolina parakeet, but this bird is distributed in the northeastern part of the continent totally unexpected. And by the way, the sun parakeet is a highly endangered bird because of the pet trade. Uh, the pop wild populations have been devastated. So we've used, going back to steady skins and cutting into the toe pads and extracting DNA, we've answered two types of questions. We've looked at 
relationships with this most recent example and that early example on how sparrows, how changes occurred on the population level. So I want to emphasize another uh, type of tool that avian ecologists have been using for some years to address these kinds of questions. And I, but I don't have time to go into depth of the, all of these, but I want to give an example, a recent example of that right there. Back in the winter of 2004, 2005, there was an unprecedented, massive invasion or, or eruption of great gray owls, this is a great gray owl, into the northern United States. In the state of Minnesota alone, there were over 5,200 records of great gray owls recorded that winter in the state. And unfortunately, there was fairly high mortality associated with this event. Uh, event. There were nearly 800 specimens that were found dead or injured. And a group of researchers, Gary Graves and some of his colleagues at the Field Museum of Natural History who preserved, fortunately, quite a few of these specimens, out of 200, a subsample of 265 birds, they found that only two individuals were young birds. So that was quite surprising. The vast majority of these birds were adults. They looked at stomach contents for over 500 and documented that. But they also used stable isotope analysis to look at some other questions associated with this eruption. And one of those, they will use uh, carbon and nitrogen, those values uh, in, in liver and muscle, looking at the nutritional condition of these owls. And it determined that approximately a third of these great gray owls were in a state of starvation. So even if you hadn't had a high mortality due to collisions with cars, roughly a third of these birds might have starved uh, and they would have made it back to their breeding grounds in Canada. Now there are a number of other things that you can do with uh, stable isotopes with this set of specimens. Uh, I'm not, I don't have time to go into those and maybe touched on some subsequent talks, but there are a plethora of studies you can use using this particular tool with these specimens. So they just scratch the surface. So two main points I want you to uh, go away with from this is um, you can never predict how specimens will be used in the future. That, that house sparrow example is a good one where the new technology comes along. You can address old standing questions as well as questions that we can't even formulate at this point in time. The other is that we need to continue collecting. We need to augment these collections and there are are innumerable reasons for doing that. But as everyone in this room probably realizes, that about 20 years ago, a 900-pound gorilla walked in the room, and it's called um, climate change. So there's one reason alone why we need to continue collecting, is documenting what's going on with humans continue to impact the, the planet is. We're using specimens to address all kinds of questions.